Hi everyone, welcome to Medscape's Facebook Live. My name is Arifa Casaboy. I'm a primary care internist and I'm senior medical correspondent at Medscape. And I'm here today with my guests. We're talking about medical marijuana. Our patients are using marijuana products, whether they're recreational or medicinal, and they're coming to us with questions. So today's Facebook Live um, is really to discuss how do we answer those questions and what questions do you have about medical marijuana? Very few doctors these days are you know, well versed on the topic to adequately answer these questions, so we want to really dive in deep. So I want to introduce our guests today. I've got Captain Althea grant Lindsay here today. She's come in from Atlanta from the CDC. She's a coordinator for several cross-cutting behavioral health areas, including marijuana, mental health, and alcohol. Her title is Senior Advisor for Science to the Deputy Director for Non-Infectious Diseases at the CDC. I also have Dr. Diana Martins Welch here. She's a palliative care physician and assistant professor at Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine. She specializes in palliative care for cancer patients, and she also sees patients for medical cannabis consultations. Now, I would love for you guys to send us your questions. We're here talking about medical marijuana. Um, while those questions are rolling in, I thought we'd go ahead and get started. Um, why don't we start, if each of you could just tell us what you do related to medical marijuana. Sure, I'll start. Okay, great. Um, so I coordinate CDC's Cannabis and Public Health Program. With respect to that program, we focus on monitoring, really understanding what the trends are. Okay. Um, the second thing is really understanding the science and translating that into information that the public can understand because a lot of it's complex. And then the third thing we really do is try to focus on technical assistance to states. Many states have approved m marijuana for either medical reasons or adult use, and the state public health departments need support on how to protect the health of their population, so we provide technical assistance. Okay, so as each state sort of changes mm -hmm. their rules. Yep. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I know with the elections coming up, that may Yeah, there's again several some ballot more. measures this November. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, how about you? So I'm an adult palliative care physician trained in internal medicine. Um, my niche is in oncology patients, but um, I started getting uh, involved with the medical cannabis program here in New York State about three years ago. And um, from then, I started taking on not just cancer patients, but uh, chronic pain patients and people who qualified for New York State's cannabis program who I felt could benefit from the cannabis, uh, medical cannabis. And so since then, it's really taken off and I've, I've seen, um, I've done close to 700 uh, medical cannabis certifications in the past three years and I've gained a lot of experience in doing so. So That's I'm happy great. to share what I've learned. That's great. And I know we were talking earlier, New York's program mm -hmm. is quite developed. So I think there's a lot of information you'll have to share with us that maybe other physicians in other states um, just hope for soon. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. So we've got a question coming in from Pablo. This is a great starter question. Which patients do you think benefit the most from medical marijuana? You want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, in my experience, it tends to be patients who have um, chronic pain and other advanced illnesses. Um, my cancer patients, multi uh, have multiple benefits from it. Those going undergoing chemotherapy, they have nausea, they have loss of appetite, weight loss, um, pain from their cancer and treatments. So on multiple fronts, it can really help um, the cancer patient. But I've also seen chronic pain patients be able to, you know, lower the use of other um, analgesics. So I think those two populations come to mind when I first think about who who would benefit most. Sure. What about? Um, do you have any patients with like MS? Or I've definitely certified um, a handful of multiple sclerosis and other neuromuscular conditions um, for which medical cannabis is approved in New York State. Um, I don't have a wealth of experience with those patients, but I definitely have seen um, patients do well with, uh, with, especially with high CBD products. Okay. And what's your experience with that? So, and, and we're coming at this from an evidence-based sure, viewpoint. Sure, absolutely, And yes. we definitely had this um, as a question to really support the states in evaluating what they were doing. So we, which means several federal agencies, um, several state agencies supported um, the National Academy of Science to really review this question. A few years ago, this um, report was published in 2017. And basically, they looked at all maybe 21 indications yes. that marijuana 
marijuana may be used for, may be approved for in different states, and said, well, what is really the evidence that um, cannabis or cannabinoids are effective at helping these conditions? And unfortunately, out of the 21 conditions that they evaluated, they only found three where um, cannabis was helpful. Diane has already talked about <laughs> them. One was pain. Yes. Um, they found significant evidence that it reduces pain. Um, the second, similar cancer patients, um, nausea, increasing appetite, and we already knew that from the work sure. with the synthetics. And then finally, um, you have spasms related to multiple sclerosis. So those were the three conditions where there was a lot of evidence. It does not mean that cannabis may not be effective for the other um, conditions, um, but it just means that what they found is that we had not enough clinical trials to say one way or, or another. And then, and of course, finally, this summer we saw the FDA approve the first. I was going to ask you about yeah, that, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, approve Epiodiolex, which was like the first CBD deri derived from the marijuana plant itself. Um, for two rare forms of epilepsy. So we basically have four conditions where there's significant evidence, and we have a lot of work to do with respect to research to figure out whether it's helpful for the other 17. Okay, right, a lot of it's anecdotal <laughs> yes. at that point. Yes. yes. All right, and um, I think as we move forward, I wanna just take a step back and talk a little bit about the chemicals mm -hmm. in marijuana, so the yeah. THC and the CBD. And we have a question coming in about the mixture of those, sort of mm. the ratio of those. And then there's always the CBD on its own. So right. if you could um, speak to those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Do, would you start, yeah. Diana? Yeah, I'll yeah. start. So delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, more commonly known as THC, is um, one of the many cannabinoids that come from the cannabis plant. Um, we know that there are over 60 that are unique to cannabis. So THC and cannabidiol, better known as CBD, are, are two of those um, major phytocannabinoids, as we call them. Um, so those are the ones that we know the most about, have been most studied, and what is usually dosed out in the non-bud um, formulations, the oils and the, and the edibles and um, the vapes. So CBD and THC ratios, or a mixture of the two, is usually how it's doled out in medicinal formulations. Um, and from my understanding, and in doing some reading on, on the, different, um, the different studies that have been done, comparing THC only to CBD only to a mixture of both. Um, I do have a preference and it's been shown that the mixture of both does tend to work okay. best. Mm -hmm. um, THC unopposed can have much more psychoactive effect, um, whereas when CBD is in there, it sort of dampens that psychoactivity. Okay, so it's less intoxicating. Mm -hmm. is, and then um, just for our audience, so you mentioned bud. Yes. <laughs> what does that mean? Um, so that's that's usually the smoked. Um, uh, okay. You know, the, the I just wanted to make sure because I think all and not yeah. everybody has the the lingo yeah, down. Right. So no, that's good. Okay, great. Now we have a question from Janet. Okay. Um, how do you screen medical? Um, how do you screen patients for medical cannabis? Um, so they in New York State they make it pretty easy. There are 13 qualifying conditions, so a patient does have to meet one of those qualifying conditions in order to be certified for the program. Um, so the, and on that list is are things like chronic pain and mm -hmm. cancer and multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, among other things. So that's an easy um, way to just from off the okay. bat, do they meet the qualifying condition? And then they also have to have a qualifying symptom um, associated with the condition. So they have to have two criteria met, at least here in New York State. But most most states have the same sort of um, guidelines for their programs. So it's a qualifying for the symptoms as in pain or mm -hmm. nausea. Vomiting. Yes. Is there a criteria for what they've, what treatments they failed, or is that something no, that's okay? not necessarily. No, there is nothing that says that they have had to fail um, more traditional therapies. Uh, most clinicians do feel comfortable um, incorporating cannabis once one or more therapies have been tried un unsuccessfully, and then trying cannabis as you know, sort of a second or third option. Okay, and what is your experience? I know you bring the national piece to it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think Diana really hit it. It's very different across states, right? So even the list of conditions that are qualifying conditions vary 
um, by state. And so some states have really strict criteria where there's only a few conditions that they approve cannabis for. And some may, it may be pain, which isn't necessarily a condition itself. A lot of different patient groups might experience pain. Mm -hmm. So really it's you just have to figure out from which state you're in. Is there in. any advice for the clinicians, <laughs> like for their state, how to go about figuring out what? Well, so I have to say, in retrospect, because we don't have evidence for most of the conditions, right, you right. really can't give advice, right? Yeah. If it's not one of those four conditions where you have evidence that it's effective, so the physician is really trying to figure it out for themselves, unfortunately. Sort of where they land yes. with the evidence that's there. That's, that's there, or even anecdotal maybe weak um, or evidence from their patients. Okay, all right. Um, all right, so we have a question from Brandy. Um, how do you determine the dosage and does the dosage vary by condition? And when I was looking at this, I also thought it was interesting. I mean, depending on which product you're using, the dosing really varies. Um, I guess, tell us about that. Right, so as with any other medication, um, you wanna start low and go slow. So that's always the mantra, right? When you know we're starting patients on, on an opioid or a benzo, anything that can sure. be mind altering, you wanna start low and go slow. So that's my mantra, especially with THC. I'm very cautious with THC. Many of the patients who are looking for medical cannabis are are, they have advanced illnesses of some sort. They have conditions that are limiting. You don't want to throw something on them that mm -hmm. might be a little too much for them to handle and then have an adverse event. So that being said, I start with very low dosage of THC, usually in a one-to-one -one ratio with CBD, depending on the condition though. Every case is unique. So you do have to take into account um, a patient's history with marijuana use. I'm gonna treat someone who has never used marijuana differently than I would someone who's been using it every day. Um, so that is something you have to take into account as well. Also, which kind of symptom are you treating? Um, there are some conditions where, you know, inflammatory bowel disease, for example, you, you're looking for an anti-inflammatory effect where you really want more of the CBD um, in certain circumstances, Parkinson's. CBD, that, that's really where they have the anti-spasticity. Um, so you want some CBD predominant formulations in some conditions, whereas usually in my world with the cancer patients, a one-to-one -one ratio is more along the lines where we wanna go because we usually want more THC effects. Okay, now most physicians out there, our audience, they're not gonna actually be giving out this right. information. Just like you said, I mean, where there's, uh, you have to have clearly much more training. If a patient's out there and they're kind of doing it on their own mm -hmm. and they come to you, um, what safety issues do you, uh, should a doctor really make sure they convey to the patient? And when um, the doctor's taking the history, like what, what should I be making sure I ask about? Um, so as far as you know, safety in using, incorporating medical cannabis into the regimen, you know, I always find out if patients are driving, if they're if they're working. If if they are, you have to take that into account. What the daytime usage would be, as opposed to maybe nighttime, where we can use a little more THC, um, where they're not you know getting behind the wheel. And this sort of can apply to any other medication I'm prescribing. You know, that might be mind altering. Sure. So I don't view it any differently in those circumstances. But certainly, you want to know the functionality of the patient and make sure that they're not operating heavy machinery after use, especially when you're using a THC, um, you know, predominant dose or a, a higher dose of THC. Um, but other things um, as far as the other medications they're using, are there potentials for um, drug interactions? Um, there, cannabis is actually listed on um, a lot of these drug interaction checkers, so you can run the patient's medications against cannabis to okay. see if there's anything potential coming up. One thing that is well known is Coumadin or Warfarin mm -hmm. um, can be impacted by um, CBD and THC, so you have to just be cautious of that and make sure people okay. are more mindful when they're starting out cannabis. Okay. And I would just add that there, you know, cannabis, like any other drug, has adverse effects too. And certain populations might be more, more vulnerable sure, yes. to those. So you want to understand if they have an underlying mental health condition. Because one of the things that the um, NAS report found is that you may have a higher risk of psychotic events or schizophrenia. Um, certain populations 
are they pregnant? <laughs> you want to make sure they're not pregnant. Sure. Um, those vulnerable populations. Um, you may want to know if they have an underlying substance use issue because cannabis, particularly THC, can be addictive like any other drug. And I, although people think that, oh, it's not addictive, you can develop a uh, um, use disorder. And so there are other kind of psychobehavioral things you may want to evaluate as well. And it's not going to be for every population. Um, if they're elderly, um, you know, it may be disorienting. They may be at higher risk for falls. There are all these other concerns that you have to take into context. That sounds... Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the psychosis issue. It's something that I always screen for. Um, any hi personal history or even a first degree family member with a history of schizophrenia is a real red flag for, for THC use, so something you have to keep in mind. Okay. Um, all right, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We're talking about medical marijuana today, and we'd love to hear from you any questions you have. We've got our experts here today to, to talk to you about that. I see a question from Amy. Any side effects that you've noticed when using medical marijuana? Are there patients that would not do well with this, patient, with this medication? So we actually just, sort of covered yeah. that. But just to reiterate, the big ones, um, so a history of a mental health. So the, I know you guys mentioned the psychosis. Mm -hmm. I also read about bipolar disorder um, as well. Right, and, and also, although not clinical trials, uh, some observational studies have shown that particularly young people, teens, um, may be at high risk for anxiety or depression or even suicidation. suicidation. Yeah. But, although that's not causal, we don't know, but there's some ecological studies, so you really want to be careful. Okay. Oh, this is a good question from Janet. Do physicians need special training and what type of training or certification? Um, so yes, most states have um, their, their, their physicians or their advanced practice practitioners who are looking to become registered with their state program go through um, some third party education. We, we, have a, we have in New York State here a program that we use, an online education program. And then we, after, after we've completed it, it's a four hour course, then we're able to register with the Department of Health. Okay. We recently actually looked at this question to see what kind of continuing education was available to physicians, and we identified this as really a place where there just needs to be a lot more work. There was continuing education. A lot of it was industry funded, and I know a lot of people would like it to not be and be more okay. objective. <laughs> um, and so this is an area where a lot of states do not have kind of good required um, continuing education for for providers. What about for medications like Marinol? Um, as far as being educated on it, THC? Just, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, just knowing the basics, um, you know, what it's indicated for, I don't think anyone who's prescribing Marinol on a regular basis really has a good grasp of, of THC and how okay. it works <laughs> in the body. Um, honestly speaking, because I'll say the four-hour course I alluded to really taught me nothing about, about <laughs> cannabis. I'm, everything I learned was self-taught. Okay. Um, you know, so I took initiative to learn on my own. So I don't have much faith in what's out there um, to teach clinicians who are interested in getting involved with cannabis. Rather, their onus is on the clinician to self-educate. Now, you have residents and fellows that come through? Mm -hmm. or Yeah. Okay, so yeah. that's the training. I mean, if you're at a program... Um, right. You can um, look if you're interested in that at, at the training level. You could. It, it look gets for a really deep because we have an endocannabinoid system, mm -hmm. and really, you know, we can get it. We can talk for hours just on how that works and how how the cannabinoids bind to the system. Um, right now, we're just sort of scratching the surface and getting this introduced into the medical school curriculum. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how many medical schools out there are actually teaching their patients about, I'm, I'm sorry, their, their, their learners about how the endocannabinoid mm -hmm. system works. Because still there's a stigma behind cannabis and, and, and so we need to overcome that and really start mm -hmm. teaching uh, people earlier on in their medical training. So um, are there any plans for training programs that are Anything that you know of? I know that a lot of states are really looking at this issue. I don't know of any specifically broad-based um, clinician training because a lot of, obviously, a lot of provider training comes from your professional groups, et cetera. Sure. And so I'm not familiar with any professional groups providing continuing it's education a tough around topic this topic. In this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but maybe there's some out there, and if there are, we'd love to know about them. Okay, <laughs> yes, actually, I'm sure. Uh, those of you out there, um, we're talking about medical marijuana today. We'd 
love to hear your questions. And actually, if you have information about what's going on in your state, please share it. I think all of us have a lot of questions related to that. Um, so this is a question from Jeff. Um, what experience do you have using cannabis during chemotherapy or radiation? Um, any guidelines? Are there any guidelines out there to help with that? Um, so not not really no um so again we're scratching the surface so with all of this medical cannabis and how we incorporate it into the uh into the uh, into the patient experience so i i personally anecdotally have a lot of experience um, in using cannabis for cancer patients undergoing both chemo and radiation and anecdotally i see a lot of positive results patients are able to better tolerate their chemo regimens they're not having as much nausea and vomiting they're eating better they're keeping their weight stable and their pain is also better controlled anxiety sleep so the list goes on and on as to how it has helped so many patients be being able to reduce the symptom burden and better tolerate their treatments overall and get through the treatments with more ease so in that regard um, it's been very helpful um, the, the, the the oncology societies don't have any rigorous guidelines that are really um, dictating how we should um, proceed with treating cancer patients okay. at this point in time. Yeah, I think most of the work has been done with, you know, um, synthetic cannabinoids, basically right. isolated single compounds. And we really don't know a lot about what happens in the whole plant yeah. context, mm -hmm. as Diana has, mm -hmm. has mentioned. Almost few to no studies have been done um, in that realm. Mm -hmm. So okay. we still have a lot to learn. And then taking a step back, what products are you actually using? Um, so the, pro the products through the New York State um, program are, sure. are available in a sublingual oil or tincture, a capsule, or an oil that's vaporized via an e-cigarette. Um, so those are the three formulations that I'm most comfortable with using. Um, other states do have smokable and edible formulations that are available for patients. Um, given that most of my patients are cancer patients, many have lung cancer, I wouldn't promote the smoking mm -hmm. sure. aspect. With the edibles, I'm also a little bit finicky with because it's easier to overshoot on the dose and then it stays a, long, a, a while longer in the system. I like the oils when we're first starting out because they don't last as long and it's much easier to manipulate the dose um, for a little bit higher or lower as we're sort of doing that dose mm -hmm. finding. Um, so I do find that's the best way to start in okay. my, my practice. All right. All right. This is a question from Jan. Thank you. Um, I would like to know how insurance companies are handling legal prescribing. Well, they're not. Um, <laughs> okay. So, well, that was easy. <laughs> the medical cannabis um, that's that's doled out from the dispensary programs um, is not covered by health insurance because, um, on a federal scale, mm -hmm. it's not it's not considered a legal medication. It's a Schedule One substance. Um, so, in, in until it becomes um, either a Schedule Two or a lesser substance, we're not going to see the health insurance companies taking part. Unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that technically physicians aren't prescribing cannabis, mm -hmm. right? Okay. They're making recommendations. And so they're giving patients a recommendation, but then the patient has to go to the dispensary independent of that physician mm -hmm. and find a product that they think is appropriate to them in most states. And so it's a very different than what we're used to seeing where a, a physician gives you a specific prescription for a dose. You show up for the pharmacy and that's what you get. Unfortunately, you might recommend cannabis for your patient, but you don't know what your patient will actually receive once they go to And that's pretty scary as a clinician <laughs> who, who, who recommends on a regular basis. Um, I don't know what, what the dispensary will ultimately sell the patient because they can change their minds once they get there and buy something else. And that happens quite frequently. Oh, wow. Um, okay. So it's, it, and then I have to deal with sort of the repercussions of using a dose that I did not recommend. So, you know, in some ways the programs are so restrictive and then in other ways it's kind of scary how little control we have as clinicians over what the cannabis dose is. Mm -hmm. Now I read one article, a physician in uh, California was using a na naturopath. A um, naturopath. Yeah. Oh, natural. So what's mm -hmm. your experience with... Um, so believe it or not, and I might be wrong, people from California, excuse me if I'm wrong, but I think that is the most common prescriber in certain states like California. I think a, a many MDs and um, DOs are not 
actually doing the recommendations. I think a lot of patients are going to naturopaths to get the rec, and it depends on what provider group the state authorizes mm. to give a recommendation. So it may be very state specific. Okay. Yeah, in yeah. New York State, you can only be an MDDO, NP, or PA to certify and recommend cannabis. Okay. All right, we have a question from Sydney. Um, do you think there are hindrances in medical marijuana research? Well, certainly, as we alluded yes. to, it being a Schedule <laughs> One substance, it's very difficult to study a Schedule One substance and do the types of uh, rigorous studies that the medical community wants to see before they actually accept cannabis as a, a viable medication. So we're talking about randomized control trials. Well, mm -hmm. it's very hard to do those types of studies and get them funded if it's a Schedule One substance. So a huge impediment to research. Yeah, I think one of the things I've heard, even from state labs, believe it or not, yeah. <laughs> is that because it's a Schedule One substance, your lab has to have a DA license. There are, there are other um, bureaucratic steps you have to do to just handle that substance, which adds another layer um, on to how difficult it is to do research. Are we making any progress? We're definitely making progress. It used to be yet another layer. So about a year ago, there, there used to be um, a committee that it had to be approved for and then you had to go through your normal processes through FDA, DEA license, NIDA. So at least that committee was removed. Okay. And I know that folks at the federal level are really working hard to try to make it easier for people to do research. Um, one of the things you probably saw a few years ago is that they put out a, a call for applications for other places to grow the yes. marijuana for research. So is that there isn't only just one farm and maybe a limited number of products. So there are some steps that are happening um, to try to make it a bit easier. But any Schedule One, not just marijuana, any Schedule One substance is sure. going to have regulation and that's going to be a harder to work with. Okay. All right, our next question. Um, what about treating MS? Is that outdated or still a promising treatment? Well, I think some of the most rigorous mm -hmm. evidence mm -hmm. um, that is out there for medical cannabis use is um, for MS. It's been shown to improve spasticity scores um, and I've seen it anecdotally help um, the MS patients that I've, I've uh, certified. So certainly I think it's a validated um, product. And I'll say ditto, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. one of the areas where there's some strong um, evidence that it may be helpful. Would it be sort of part of standard of care now or it's still no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not even close. It all, it okay. all goes back to the lack of um, real good validated studies. Yeah. It's okay. a catch 22. Yeah. Got it. Um, this is from Brittany. Are all manufacturers being regulated? Is the FDA involved? Um, so, no, the FDA is not involved <laughs> at all because of, be, so again, federal. I think we have to like step back, and I think we have yeah. people that are joining yeah. us. Fe on a federal scale, they're just, I, I've, it's like oil and water right now. They're not getting involved with anything to do with medical cannabis. It's a, st it's a state run program. If you're in a state where it's legal, it's run through that respective state. Um, so, but I can speak to the New York State program. Um, every dispensary chain that, it, that is growing the cannabis um, has to send their, their products through for quality checking through a central laboratory. So everything is purity checked um, and, make, and make sure that it, it meets the standards for the state. And we can go back. Um, we have one FDA approved medication. Right. Um, and then we have this, um, the Epidiolox and, Ep then, and then the two synthetics. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So, and, and I should also say that states have, some states have very stringent um, quality assurance processes around their um, dispensary. So they're, they're measuring the quantity of THC, but they're also looking for, you know, pesticides and fungal pathogens and different types of contamination. So it's, when states have a very well-regulated program, it's not mm -hmm. like just anything going on. So there's okay. some mm -hmm. level of regulation, although not at the federal level. Mm -hmm. This is from Adriana. What credible resources can we refer our patients to? Any medical guidelines? Uh, this is a great question. Mm -hmm. You know, what, how do we, how do we, in, with such a vague because if, uh, if you were to consult with Dr. Google, you're going to find a lot of overwhelming information, a lot of websites that you don't really know what's credible. Um, 
so I get I get most of my my knowledge through such searching the medical literature via PubMed. Um, there are there are good books out there. Cannabis pharmacy mm -hmm. comes to mind, um, but I think that's also more for the clinician. As far as where patients get their information from, I but mean, I mean I think <laughs> for the it's hard to the say. study you mentioned. Um, I read a the report. It's excellent. It's, it's, it's difficult for patients to read. Well, though. this these are I mean <laughs> these are physicians yeah. mainly that and and uh, um, pharmacists, nurses. Um, yep. So um, our audience for our audience. What, what would you recommend? So for our audience, and we actually took some pieces of that report and distilled them down. So please do check out our website. We have a nice summary <laughs> of the report. So that, that might be a place. Um, and I think, you know, FD, even though sometimes the government is stigmatized, I think FDA, NIDA, and others do actually do a really great job of keeping their websites and their information up to date. So I would go to those websites for um, yeah, I mean, I thought the PDF booklet, I yes. mean, it, it was downloadable. I mean, the initial site says you have to buy it, but I think when yep. you click, you can actually and download it. And it has nice it. summaries right. as well that are available. So you don't have to read the whole multi-hundred page. And tone. the online course that you took, how is that just for New York State, or is that something um, some of our audience could access? Um, it, well, it was through the answerpage.com. Um, I think they this is a, a website that hosts many different types of courses for, for these types of uh, um, uh, things, but I don't know that necessarily it provided great information. There are some websites that uh, that I remember looking up um, in years past. I'll have to add them to the to the site later because I cannot recall the names. Okay, of the all right, that's good. But there right. are some resources out there that have pages upon pages of, of information. I'll get that back to you guys though. Okay, great. Um, so this is from Karina. Cannabis versus opioids. How do you know when are there advantages to either? I'm surprised it's taken us this long Don't to get to this question. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Karina, because I was, I was waiting for this. I mean, the data is out there going both ways, whether, right. um, whether it's going to help the opioid epidemic or not. Where do both of you, I'll start with you. <laughs> you, you give me the hard question first. Um, <laughs> So I think this is a complex question because I think there's so much interest because there's been those epidemiologic studies that we've seen over the past few years where they found that states that legalized medical, they've seen an association with redu reduction in overdose deaths. Sure. They've seen reductions in um, prescribing rates and they've seen reductions of opioid use in certain populations. So I think we all want it to be the answer, but based on those studies, we have no evidence that that's causal. So one of the things I do want to caution people when they're looking at those studies is to also know that we've been actively, um, from a public health point of view and at the state level, trying to address the opioid epidemic. So it may just be circumstantial. There may have been prevention right. strategies mm -hmm. those years that they also happen to have legalized medical marijuana. That being said, because of the pain evidence being so strong, you know, that's an a, a area that looks really promising for potential new therapy. So I don't want to dismiss it out of hand, but I don't think that we can at this point say that um, marijuana is the answer to the opioid crisis, okay. yeah. unfortunately. And what what about from a chronic pain perspective? Are they synergistic or? Well, so yes, there there is a synergy that has been shown on a very small scale um, in chronic pain patients that that when cannabis was um, this was smoked cannabis that was administered in a controlled setting to patients who were both on long acting and short acting opioids. While there was not an increase in the opioid level in the blood, there was a decrease in pain. Some sort of synergy is happening when cannabis and opioids come together to really mitigate that pain. Um, and I've seen it anecdotally. Um, and on small scale surveys that we've done, um, that patients who are suffering from chronic pain, um, requiring opioids, have lessened their doses as a result of incorporating medical cannabis into their regimen. So there's something to be said for that. And I think we do need to look further into that and really show mm -hmm. it on a larger scale. Um, we do desperately need alternatives to opioids. Um, you know, the, the 2016 CDC guidelines have been interpreted by many clinicians to mean 
we're not prescribing any more opioids. Well, what do we do for these chronic pain patients now? We need viable alternatives, and many of them have been through the gamut of non-opioid analgesics with very little relief. Um, and so that's another crisis, you know, waiting to, to, to happen, is well, how do we appropriately treat these chronic pain patients? Mm -hmm. So I see opioid not necessarily as the panacea, but definitely as one um, viable option to, to uh, propose. Okay. All right, so if we're here talking about medical marijuana today, and I have, uh, we're really enjoying all the questions you guys are sending. Please send us some more. Um, we'll, um, anything you wanted to know about uh, marijuana, medical marijuana. Um, I had some questions <laughs> in the meantime while we're waiting. Um, what about K2? How does that play in? <laughs> So I don't want people to think it's synonymous with medical <laughs> marijuana because exactly. it certainly is not. It's not even marijuana. It's not okay. even marijuana. And this is my public service announcement. It's poison. <laughs> so it's not okay, marijuana, good. it's poison. But unfortunately, we use the same terms to, re to refer to synthetic cannabinoids, the FDA-approved drugs. We'll mm -hmm. refer to them as synthetic cannabinoids. But we'll also refer to these illicit substances like spice and K2 as synthetic cannabinoids. And so sometimes people confuse them. Mm -hmm. K2 is nothing like marijuana marijuana. Um, it's nothing, it's, it's much, much stronger agonist um, than THC and okay. therefore has much more severe effects, um, increased heart rate, hallucinations, palpitations, even death in some circumstances because this is usually used as an illicit drug. It's not even a pure whatever it is. It's often mixed with other poisons and other chemicals and so people are using this um, sometimes thinking they're using fake weed, but it really is nothing like weed. It's often poisons. There are hundreds of chemi different chemicals marketed as um, synthetic marijuana, um, and they're very dangerous. Okay. All right, I've got a um, question from Gabriella about topical uses with uh, the marijuana products. So, um, great question. I don't know about studies on topicals. What I've heard is, again, a lot of anecdote. Um, and because it's not systemically absorbed, a lot more safe to administer. Um, I have lots of patients using topicals. And in New York State, where we don't have them available quite yet, they are legal in New York State, but they're, they're just not available through our dispensary program, unfortunately, yet. Um, I have patients using topicals from out of state, um, especially my elderly patients with really bad osteoarthritis and and you know, if it's a localized pain like a knee or you know a shoulder, mm -hmm. um, it's ideal for use in those circumstances where you're not looking to get them systemic, systemically absorbed because you're treating one local area. And I've seen good results with them, but again, I don't know any studies. That's interesting. I don't know mm -hmm. any studies mm -hmm. with topicals either. What about um, the our audience um, pa that have patients come in that are just using CBD oil for like depression or anxiety or migraine. Oh, I'm so mm. glad you brought that up because mm. um, there's, it's a real trend right now. And with that, it's uh, it, it brings on a lot of troublesome, um, you know, circumstances because I don't know what's real anymore. <laughs> Patients are using CBD from everywhere. Um, they call them head shops. They're bringing them in from head shops. I don't know what this means. And I don't know if it's legit, if it really is CBD. Um, the hemp derived CBD sort of flies under this legal radar. So, yes. so um, it's it's sold online and in you know Whole Foods like markets, and so my, my question is always like, what's the source, and is it pure? And so there are some online companies I found have to be reputable, and so because of the cost, out of pocket uh, cost associated with the medical cannabis program here in, in New York State, among other states, sometimes I do find that we that we do best with supplementing some hemp-derived CBD um, for issues to do with anxiety and um, <clears throat> and chronic pain, especially because of the anti-inflammatory effects. Again, this is not well-studied area, so we're sort of, you know, practicing out um, on, on, the, on, the, on the fringe here, so. And your patients <laughs> have the chronic pain with the anxiety versus just the anxiety. Um, I find it very difficult to tease them apart, to be perfectly honest. Okay. Yeah. It's it's sort of like a chicken and egg sort of thing. Got you know, it. It, it does it does it's a self perpetuating thing as well. So you'll find that many chronic pain patients will develop anxiety or mm -hmm. that they were set up to, to, to get chronic pain because of their predisposition um, to anxiety. So it's um, very hard to tease apart. So you got you gotta treat both. Any um, information about how they're monitoring or um, 
keeping track of all these stores that are popping up with the CBD this is This has been a huge problem, right? So we've had outbreak investigations around CBD oil and... Like with mold? No, like not mold, mold, just products marketed as CBD oil. Ah, it turns okay. out mm. they're not CB, there's right. no CBD in them. <laughs> Got it. Um, and there might be synthetic cannabinoids in them. There may be other issues. So I think part of the problem is that everyone's marketing a CBD product, mm -hmm. as Diana has said. It's flying under the radar. So, and I also want to say CBD is a bit of a, I'm a biochemist, so CBD is a bit of a biochemical mystery. Okay. For us about the mechanism of action, I think we understand THC a lot better. There's actually been a lot less research, believe it or not, on CBD. So all the things that folks are marketing CBD for, we don't have a lot of evidence around, There's, unfortunately. I mean, evidence, not even scientific trials, we don't even understand mechanisms. We don't even understand mechanism, right? So CBD like doesn't bind to CB1 receptor, CB2 receptor. We don't know what CBD is doing. Okay, honest. all right. That's actually <laughs> important to know. Okay, so we're going to wrap up today. Um, I want to thank all of you for the questions. Um, if you have any last minute thoughts, let us know. Did we cover everything or any? Um, you'd like there's to so add? many things I wish we could cover. Um, <laughs> Glad to have you guys back. <laughs> I guess if I had one last plug, it'd be that we need to, re to, to reschedule cannabis so that we can actually do the appropriate studies that the medical, the medical community so desperately wants. And I think if I have one last thing to say, this is an area where we need so much research. So we need pe encourage people to go into research in this area. Most of why we're having this conversation is because, is because studies haven't been done. We need we scientists. We really need scientists. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Althea. Thank you, Diana. <laughs> Um, thank you all for joining us. Your questions were great. Um, we'll have a few follow-ups for you, but um, we're going to go ahead and close out the Medscape Facebook Live now. Thank you for joining us today.